Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fad.com. I will be your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Duval. Last night, we talked about holographic survivors, and we discussed the possibilities that our world, our existence here, is actually nothing but a hologram, a holographic box. And uh, unlike the other two scenarios we've, uh, we've chatted about in the past, the first one being, well, you and I are students going to university. Uh, we're 19 years old, roughly. Our parents have paid for us to have a very expensive education, and that education includes spending a Friday afternoon for a few hours of our time plugged into a computer basically like the Matrix movie, where you and I are actually inside of a video game, an educational learning program. And we actually are born into the program, and we live and we die here, whether it's 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 100 years. And at the end of uh, this uh, virtual 100-year lifespan, you and I wake up safe and alive and healthy and whole and still only 19 years old, and what for us in the real world would only be a few hours, we've actually lived an entire lifetime. And I would imagine that there's a grading process the computer would see, you know, if we had the choices of uh, A, B, and C, which ones did we choose, did we make the right choices, and did we pass the class? Well, if that's the case, then the program's been hacked and gone horribly wrong because I don't think I would pay for my children to be tortured for 50, 60, 70, 100 years by uh, sadistic, soulless creatures known as our masters. There must be a better way of educating people. The second possible scenario is that you and I actually live in a real world, a real universe, but in our case it would be a multiverse, where you and I live every day in multi multiple dimensions simultaneously. Our minds have the ability, the capacity, to live several different life, lives, lifetimes at the same time, which is why every night we require sleep so our mind can uh, re reboot and combine all of those experiences back into a single, single uh, consciousness and be ready for the next day. That's why we require sleep. Our bodies don't really require anything more than rest, but the mind, the psyche, requires sleep. And also, there's probably people experimenting on us, people we don't know anything about, and using us as lab rats. Then the third possibility, the third scenario, the holographic survivor scenario, where you and I, our bodies are gone, and the essence of what we truly are has been reduced to particles of light inside of a, well, a box. And its only purpose is to keep us, quote-unquote, alive until our rescue ship, I suppose, reaches its final destination and new bodies are provided for us and we start life in a new world, whether because of disaster or because of war. And that would explain this constant deja vu, at least I get, I'm sure you do too, the holographic survivor scenario is we're not actually meant to learn anything, we're not actually meant to evolve or to grow, we're simply be preserved like uh, specimens inside of a jar of alcohol. That's why, at least for me, it's like living inside your favorite uh, television show and watching it in repeats year after year after year after year. It gets to the point where you can actually talk along with the TV and say the same lines. You've seen this show so many times. So in the holographic survivor scenario, maybe the Mayan prediction of the end of the world in 2012 actually is not the end of the world. It's simply time to restart the program. And the memories that you and I share of our existence here are erased. And we start the same program all over again. This has happened before, it will happen again. We've been hearing that phrase quite a lot lately. But the interesting thing about that scenario, besides the fact it's kind of scary, besides the fact I have this feeling that if we were escaping a war, our enemies have managed to come along with us. What most people here don't realize, I've been in computers for 25 years, you've heard the phrase, you know, wipe your hard drive. 
And you figure, well, if you wipe my hard drive, you can lose all your data. That's true to a certain point. But there are different levels of computer wipes. I can wipe your hard drive so it appears to be empty, but in reality, the data is still there. It's just not accessible to you without the right software tools. To delete a hard drive completely, you have to do what we call a government level wipe. It literally wipes every bit of information off of your hard drive. If you just do a regular uh, computer hard drive wipe, there's still data in there and we can still recover all of your files. You probably don't know that. What if the people who made the holographic box you and I are in, maybe, maybe they were in a hurry, maybe they lacked uh, the facilities, maybe there were too many of us, and they just ran out of time. But what if we are in a holographic universe and every time the 2012 Mayan prophecy comes true and all of a sudden the program restarts, what should have been a complete wipe of our memories of this particular lifetime of the same program running over and over and over again is not complete. What if deja vu really is memories of the last time we did this TV show, the last time we said our lines? I did an experiment uh, off and on the last, uh, I guess, couple of months. I actually deliberately did what I wasn't supposed to do, just to see if it would affect the outcome of whatever I was working on. And I was actually kind of astonished to see it didn't change anything. The world continued on as if I had done what I should have done. Try that sometime. The jobs do, don't do it on time. See what happens. What will happen? Nothing. Because the program is written to do a certain thing over and over and over again, regardless of what you and I, independent thinking, reasoning beings, decide to do. Try it. You might... Uh, you might be astonished. So tonight I thought we would chat about permission to speak. It sort of goes hand in hand with the holographic survivors scenario. I remember my time, I was five years at NASA working. I was, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm a computer guy. I was, my job included um, education and public outreach, public relations. I was head of the audio video lab there at Caltech at uh, the IPAC uh, image processing, I forget, analysis of the IPAC at Caltech. And I was also in charge of trade shows. I was also doing graphics. I was also the system administrator. I had like seven different jobs. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, this horrible, horrible woman who didn't even have a, uh, her doctorate, she'd actually... Um, she had actually told me, quite frankly, that she'd had sex with her professors, and that's how she got through college, and she was quite proud of that. And she never defended her thesis, which is a requirement in academia to, be, to have the right to call yourself a doctor. And she never bothered to do that either. So she basically just had sex to get her, her way through life, and she actually bragged about this. And I was warned by the other women there at uh, Caltech and at JPL to stay very far away from her. And also the various faction of gay boys warned me about her, and I just felt sorry for her. I figured she just needed a friend, a pal, and she'd stop being horrible. And of course I was proved wrong yet again. So anyway, she managed to threaten her way into a position of management. And this woman was universally hated and despised by everyone. And NASA HQ wanted nothing to do with her, but she kept getting plum assignments, and I could guess how she did that. I remember s sitting in a group of, I think, 25 women scientists and a few guys, uh, IT people, and uh, it came up that this woman was mentioned. And I had had an ongoing dialogue with one of the woman, sci women scientists there, and she said, well, if this woman is this bad, everybody would be talking about her, and she'd be gone. I said, no, people need permission first to speak before they'll talk about something like this, and she categorically refused to believe me. So, of course, she was sitting in the meeting. And so I just brought up the fact that this horrible woman was doing horrible things not only to us, but to the whole program we were working on. And all of a sudden, every person in that room started saying the same thing, telling their own horror stories about this one horrible woman. And there was my little scientist friend sitting at the table across from me. Her mouth just dropped open. And that was one of the clearest moments in my existence here that 
we as human beings, we as people, for some reason, we need permission to actually tell the truth. We need permission from somebody, and it doesn't matter who, because I was a nobody. We need permission from someone before we can actually tell the truth about any particular topic. It gets really back to the, to the herd mentality, to the, our masters calling us cattle, because 98% of us truly are cattle. We literally need someone to say it's okay, to say, hey, you're hurting me, to say, hey, stop that. What you're doing is wrong. And so I, I wonder this need we have for permission to speak. I'm wondering if you, for example, could turn to a friend and say, you know, is something bothering you? And guess at some topics. Uh, Mary Jane stole your sandwich out of the refrigerator at work and you're pissed, but you can't say anything. Did Mary Jane steal your sandwich? She stole mine. At which point, probably a whole floodgate will open. And it occurs to me this is how our masters, one of the key ways our masters have of controlling us, by making it politically incorrect to tell the truth. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, a polite way of saying this. There isn't any real polite way of saying it. Uh, I uh, spent, I, I grew up in Southern California, time in New York, and for 23 years I actually lived in Hollywood, so I, I thought I had seen every foul, dirty, despicable, loathsome act a person could commit against another person. I got to New Zealand and discovered that I had seen nothing, that the New Zealanders had refined hatred and bigotry and cruelty to a level that I, I didn't possibly imagine. But... So many times, a man would get a job because he was gay. Uh, in the case of this horrible woman at NASA, she was what we call in the United States a fag hag. She's a woman with power who likes gay boys around her. And she likes gay boys because normally gay guys tend to be much better looking than us straight guys and are, uh, work out and are very healthy. So there are quite a lot of fag hags at NASA. And uh, they had a little cadre of, of gay boys that sort of flittered around them. And so this horrible woman at NASA, manager, instead of hiring people for the quality of the work they were doing, she hired the boys because they were gay and they were good looking. And the quality of our work overall suffered. And uh, one gay boy that this horrible woman hired at NASA, uh, one of the women scientists came up to me in the hallway one day and says, why did... What are, you, what are you people at uh, EPO doing? Why did you hire this guy? We had him almost out the door. He was almost gone. Why on earth would your boss hire this? And she has several words. I can't, I don't want to use with you. But she was just horrified. This guy was a living, walking, talking nightmare. And my boss, the horrible woman, she had hired him. Why? Because he was good looking and because he was gay. And you really can't say that in a politically correct environment. You cannot say, for example, that in the United States, it used to be, and I'm sure it still is, that if a corporation hired you and you were a woman, you were a lesbian, you were black and you had children, that was a tremendous bonus for your taxes. You could write off a lot of taxes if you had those kind of people working for you. And so there was a long period of time where people were hired not because they could do the job, but they were hired because they were women, lesbian, black, or Hispanic, and had children. The fact that they didn't actually know how to do their job, well, that didn't really matter because the, the corporate bean counters saw that they got tax credits. What they never thought of and what they never considered was the fact that because these people didn't know how to do their jobs, you were losing customers, you were losing staff, you were doing ridiculous things that were costing you a fortune. But it looked good on your uh, yearly annual report. We had this many uh, female, lesbian, black or Hispanic women with children who were promoted to management level. Oh, that's wonderful. We got tax credit for that. The fact that we were losing millions of dollars <laughs> and losing customers and our corporate image was going down the toilet, that didn't matter. But because it's politically incorrect to tell the truth, 
you need permission to speak from somebody to say, hey, why is this woman in this job? She's incompetent. She's a nightmare. Why is this guy in this job? Well, he's, he's good looking and he's gay. And? Oh, well, we can't talk about that. It's not politically correct. I said, well, wait a minute. We're losing customers. We're losing money. Uh, the stress level in the department has gone through the roof. You've got people on sick leave as often as they can because they don't want to be in the same office with these people watching them destroy everything. How much damage can you do to your relationship with your client because of incompetent people who you hired because it looks politically correct? But you and I need permission to speak before we can say, hey, you're doing something really stupid. Or, hey, I don't want this person here. Or, hey, how come you started a war in Libya? Permission to speak. From my point of view, I give you permission to speak. Please speak about all these things. If you see something unbelievably stupid, you have my permission to speak. For what, <laughs> what little value that will give you. But maybe it will start with you because this really does, it really does start with you. It begins and ends with you. Talk to the people you care about. Talk to your friends, your family, the people you work with and say, hey, I give you permission to speak. What's bothering you? Maybe it starts with something as simple as that. And remember, always remember the key phrase. I listen to what you say. I watch what you do. That scares liars and politicians white. And I've seen it with my own eyes. So again, it's all up to you. So I'll leave you with a prayer, a wish, a dream, a hope for a, for a friend or a beloved stranger. May you live as long as you wish. May you love as long as you live. For the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Blumhoff. The 2012 Fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul, and how the CIA war against the human race. Their black magic captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.